Good afternoon. Well, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Bunker, the Chief Technical Officer of Aptima Group. He's worked with Aptimas for over 20 years, developing a variety of nucleic acid aptimers against a wide range of targets, including small molecules, proteins, and several cancer-associated cell lines, viruses, and tissue biopsies. He's also helped to develop the high-throughput automated Optima platform that Optima Group works with. Thank you, David. Thanks, Jane, and hello, everyone. So in today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about our Optima platform as an alternative affinity ligand to address your um, pressing affinity ligand needs. And I'm going to give you um, a few examples of how you can use an Optima within your work. So the first thing to talk about is what is an Optima? An Optima is basically a short synthetic, I'm going to keep coming back to that point, a synthetic nucleic acid strand that's been isolated from a degenerate mixed combinatorial library to do a job of interest. That job is usually to bind to a target supplied by our collaborators and partners to enable them to do a particular job. So you can think of them almost as an antibody alternative. So if you have a problem where you would like an antibody to do a particular job, but you can't get one, you can use an Optima in its place. Now, in the cartoon across the middle of the slide here, you can see one of the key advantages of Optimus straight away. So on the left hand side, you can see a representation of an antibody in purple and just next to it, you can see an Optima. And immediately you can see that the Optima is a lot smaller. So in terms of molecular weight, an Optima is about one tenth to one fifteenth the size of an antibody. So they're a lot, lot smaller. Now, that has a, a number of advantages. If you think of them in terms of cell and tissue targeting, an Optima can get to sites that antibodies are just too big to get to. It also means if you're loading them onto, for example, a biosensor surface, you can get a lot more Optima onto that surface, which gives you a greater potential for um, more interactions. And those interactions are closer to a surface. So generally, it makes a biosensor a little more sensitive. On the right hand side of the slide there, you can see two different ways in which Optimas can interact with their target. So on the far right, you can see an Optima in blue interacting with a protein target in purple in much the same way that an antibody would. So it finds a compatible surface and sits on that surface, forming a network of interactions. And then just to the left of that, you can see a slightly different mode of interaction where the Optima in blue is interacting with a small molecule target in purple. And in this case, the Optima is folding around that target. So it's forming a cage around that small molecule target. Now, Optimas can do this because they're very, very flexible little molecules. Now at Optima Group, we have um, three key platforms that we work with that are each tailored to different types of targets. I'll come back to this later on, but those are generally small molecules, proteins, and then cells and tissues. Some advantages of the Optima platform are highlighted on the slide here. So broadly, antibodies are targeted against proteins and peptides. Occasionally, you get them against viruses, but other targets tend to be a bit more difficult. So complex molecules like whole cells, can be very difficult to generate um, antibodies against because you generally have to have a recombinant version of your target for you to uh, inject into a, a mouse, a rabbit, a llama, whatever. Okay, Optimas are developed entirely through in vitro automated processes in our case. This means that we can work with virtually any sort of target. As long as we can handle it in the lab, we can work with it. That also means that we can handle targets that are not necessarily immunogenic or maybe even slightly toxic. So again, we can work with this on a robotic platform, so it doesn't matter if the target stimulates an immune response or not. 
When it comes to bioprocessing, it's also useful to be able to control the binding conditions and indeed the release conditions. So we can change the conditions under which an optima binds to its target. That's very useful and I'll come on to that again later. Um, in terms of production, optimas have got a number of advantages. So I mentioned at the start of the presentation that these are synthetic molecules. So that means that when you have an optima, you can then go out and have it manufactured at any number of oligonucleotide manufacturing companies. At the end of the day, it's synthetic, so it's just chemistry to build up an optima. So once you have your optima sequence, you can make it again and again and again using routine chemistry. So you've got much more control over your reproducibility of your molecule. So you don't have the batch to batch variability issues that you do with antibodies and other platforms. Optimas are also able to be um, stored and transported dry. They're very soluble, so there's no issues with cold chain storage or cold chain supply. You can store them at room temperature, you can ship them at room temperature, and then just resuspend them when you get them where they need to be. At Optima Group, we use a range of different um, libraries depending on the um, application and the customer's end need. So the vast majority of our libraries are DNA or RNA based. The choice there really depends on the end application. So DNA is generally easier and cheaper to manufacture. It's a little bit faster for us to work in our development programs. But the RNA libraries that we have have modified backbones to them. So they're a little more stable. So it really does depend what your application is, whether you would need stability or rapid turnaround. We also have uh, a number of structurally constrained or structurally diverse libraries, again, depending on your needs. We also have a specific library that's been tailored to work in a very different way for small molecule isolation. And I'll come back to that later on. So as I mentioned, at Optima Group, we have three different platforms each tailored for different types of targets. So we have a cell targeting platform where you might use the binders for flow cytometry or fax or IHC, that sort of application. We have a separate platform for developing binders against proteins. So this would be whole proteins, protein domains, peptides, examples. Um, here you would use them in, for example, lateral flows, um, affinity chromatography, ELISAs, and so on. And then we have a, a separate platform for developing binders against small molecule targets. So toxins, environmental contaminants, food additives, that sort of thing. Here, generally, the applications are um, either purifications or detection platforms. So again, ELISAs, lateral flows, biosensors, and so on. So firstly, I'm going to talk about um, two different platforms that we have for developing binders against cells. So this can be done in either of two ways. We refer to these as either target directed or hypothesis free. In our target directed approach, you would have your recombinant version of whatever your target is. So this is where you have a, a known receptor that you would like to target on the surface of your cell. So in this case, the target is represented by that little um, purple shape there, immobilized in the early selection rounds on magnetic beads. So in the early rounds of selection, we're enriching the population with binders, specifically targeting that receptor of interest, the purple target. In the later rounds, we then switch to cells which express that receptor. Now, this is really important to do because it makes sure that the optimus that we isolate recognize that target but also recognize it as it's presented on the surface of a cell. We do this because at the end of the day, it's no good to you if you isolate a binder that recognizes a receptor, but it ends up recognizing a portion of that receptor that's buried in the cell membrane. So it's never actually going to be presented for binding. So it's important to start with a protein and then switch to a cell expressing it. Now, if you don't have a receptor of interest, if you just want to target a cell type, we can use our hypothesis-free approach. So here we don't have a receptor in mind. Here we just use 
a cell type that we know expresses the target, so a positive cell line, and then another cell line which we know doesn't express the target, so a negative cell line. And here we use those cells as uh, in different combinations as positive and negative targets to drive the selections towards that receptor of interest. Once you've done that, you can then use those Optima binders to determine what that receptor is by um, attaching the Optima to your protein of interest and using it to pull that receptor out. And then you can identify it through proteomic means. So mass spec, for example. So this slide is to demonstrate a range of different um, applications for your Optima. So on the left-hand side is a few examples of diagnostic applications. There's bioprocessing applications in the middle and then therapeutics on the right-hand side. So if you think back to um, the early slide, I mentioned that Optimas are a lot smaller than other types of binder. Here you can see an example of where that would be an advantage. So for example, in super resolution microscopy, the closer you can get your fluorophore to your target of interest, the better resolution you're going to have. So if you can use an Optima binder that is about a fifth as tall as an antibody, your dye is automatically closer to your target. You can also do the same thing in um, lateral flows and ELISA. So you can get more um, densely packed binders on your surface so you can capture more of your target so you can have a more sensitive asset. In the middle there, we've got bioprocessing applications. I've got some slides on this coming up. Here, the Optima is attached to a, a solid support, a plate or a resin or a membrane through a, a standard linker. So this is, again, just chemistry to attach that Optima to the surface. And then you can use that to capture your target of interest, pull it out of a solution, remove all the contaminants, and then release your target of interest. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, we have therapeutic applications where the Optima can be used, for example, as a direct agonist or antagonist of the target of interest. They can be linked together, so you could have multiple Optimas doing multiple things as a, a combination therapy, or the Optimas can be conjugated to a, a therapeutic payload, so a, a drug molecule, an antisense oligo, another protein, whatever. Now, at, our, at, Optima, at Aptima Group, our process is um, laid out, as you can see here. So all projects go through a very similar workflow. So we start off with a, a consultation where we talk to the customer, learn their needs, find out how best to tailor our process to meet those end goals. We then undertake a uh, target feasibility study, which is exactly what it sounds like. So we take your target or targets of interest and do a very simple binding assay that looks at, is it possible to generate a binder against your target of interest? So there's a number of reasons for doing this, but the main one is to triage targets. So to identify whether a target is going to be suitable for optimal selection or not. Now, this is a great thing because it means we can cut out projects that are not going to be successful. So if your target is not amenable to Optima selection, we can identify that very quickly and save you time, resources, and money. But it also allows us to take the best targets to. So if you're not sure which target is going to be good, you can send us a panel and we can put all of them through this feasibility study and pick the best ones. So you can then take forward targets that have got a greater chance of success. We then move to the in vitro discovery phase. So this is the Optima selection itself to so the process of taking our library and refining it down to um, a few binders. We then have the Optima characterization, identification and optimization phase. So this is going from the full length parent Optima and identifying the minimal functional fragment that simplifies the downstream manufacturing. We can then undertake a variety of functional validations. So put that Optima into a, a test platform and make sure it does what it needs to do. And then obviously at the end of that project, there's the supply. So I've talked a little bit about the platform. I'm now going to move on to some different sorts of applications. So keep in mind, if you can do it with an antibody, there's a very good chance you can do it with an Optima. So if I haven't got examples of your type of application here, please do get in touch with us and ask us anything. 
So first off, I'm going to talk about diagnostic applications. And here you can see an example of an optima that's been developed against a small molecule target. In this case, um, the chemotherapeutic prodrug CPT11. Now, in this case, you can see the optima binder has been isolated to discriminate between CPT11, shown there in blue, and the metabolite SN38. And you can see on the biosensor here, you get a very good response from CPT11, but virtually no response at all from SN38 that differs only by that two ring structure. So that during metabolism, that two ring structure gets cleaved off to give the active SN38. And the optima here can tell the difference between those two molecules. So if you're studying, for example, drug metabolism, you can see here how an optima would help you do that. It helps you discriminate between those two very closely related molecules. Now, if this selection was flipped on its head and we had a second binder that specifically recognized SN38, but didn't recognize CPT11, you can then see how you could use those two optimas to monitor the level of each of those compounds as they're formed. So you can really then use them to monitor drug metabolism. And on the right hand side there, you can see some example data, um, again, from a partner of ours, you can see the publication at the bottom, where they put this optima through its paces. So you can see, we've got a good limit of detection, we've got a lower limit of quantification, and we've got a, a good um, precision and accuracy from this binder. These binders, as I said, can be very, very um, selective. So there's a couple more examples on the slide here. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, an optima recognizing, in this case, a peptide target. So this is a short peptide, only 20 amino acids long, with a single modification. So in this case, arginine is converted to citrulline. So that's a post-translational modification. And you can see in the biosensor data at the left hand side of the slide there, the Optima has a much stronger response to the citrulline form of the peptide rather than the arginine form. So again, you can use the binders to recognize post-translational modifications in your target of interest. Then on the right hand side, you can see um, a small molecule based Elona, so an Optima based ELISA. Here you can see three different forms. The left-hand one of the three is specific to folic acid. The central one is specific to formal tetrahydrofolate. And then the right-hand side is specific to methyl tetrahydrofolate. So you can see three very closely related molecules where the optimas that we've isolated against them recognize them independently. They don't cross-react with the other targets. Now, if we look at something a little larger, we've talked about small molecules, let's look at whole cells. So here you can see examples where we've isolated a binder against a specific cell type, and then you can attach a fluorophore, for example, to your optima and use it in flow cytometry. So on the left-hand side there, you can see an example where we've developed an optima binder against a positive cell line. So you can see the binder response there in green compared to the no optima response in red, and the non-specific control, a scrambled sequence shown in blue. So the optima is very clearly binding to its target. And if you look at the data set just to the right of that, it's then not binding to the negative cell line. So we've got specific binding from that optima. If you then look at the data on the right-hand side of the slide, here we're looking at uh, an optima binder against a, an ion channel, so NAV 1.7. The binder here very clearly binds to NAV 1.7, but has no response whatsoever to NAV 1.5. So again, you can use your Optima binders to pick out receptors on the surface of the cell and use them to characterize your cells. You can also use these in um, FACs, so you can actually sort the um, cells out based on their Optima fluorescence. And because the Optimas are not inherently toxic, you can then put those cells back into culture and grow them up. Here we have another example of a, an optima binder, in this case, isolated through our target directed approach. So the optima is recognizing CD4 in this case on the surface of a cell. And what you can see here is three different applications of that binder. So on the top left, 
you can see the Optima on a biosensor. So the Optima is immobilized and it's capturing CD4 in a dose dependent response. So you can see at higher concentrations, you get a higher responsive curve. In the data just below that on the bottom left, you can then see we've used that same Optima again in flow cytometry to sort cells that are specific and have CD4. And then on the right hand side, you can see an example from one of our partners where they've used that CD4 binding Optima in um, tissue sections from human skin. So here you can see we can actually stain the CD4 on the surface of a tissue. So there you've got three examples where we've used the same Optima in three different platforms on a biosensor, on a cell surface and on a tissue. So there's examples there of three different applications, including IHC staining. An example that everyone will be familiar with is using Optimus to recognize um, viruses. So in this case, the COVID spike protein. So here the Optimus were isolated against the spike protein itself in as little as 17 days. So this can be a very, very rapid process. And here, it's important to note that the Optimus not only recognizes the spike protein, but they also recognize that again in the context of the whole virus. And they can then be incorporated into biosensors. You can see that in the middle of the slide or into lateral flows. You can see that on the right hand side. And the great thing about these Optimus is that they recognize all the current variants of uh, COVID. So you can see down the right hand, uh, the left hand side of the slide there, the binding data that we got from the wild type and several variants all being recognized by this Optima. So I've talked about some diagnostic applications. Let's talk about bioprocessing. So as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, you can use your Optima binder to bind to a target of interest. That's great. You can use it to pull that target out. But in the selection process, we can also introduce release conditions. So not only can we make the Optima bind to your target, we can make it let go again. So you can use that to purify your target. You can capture it from a cell lysate, for example. You can wash away the contaminants, and then you can change the buffer conditions and release your target into solution and collect it. You can see on the slide here on the left hand side an example where we've done that on a biosensor. So here we've immobilized the Optima and used it to capture the target of interest from a complex matrix. So you can see that in the center of that binding data, the, the um, target is retained during the wash phase. But as soon as we change the buffer into the elution buffer, the target is released, lets go of the surface and floats away. And then that binding event can be repeated. So if you're wanting to use this in protein purification, you want to be able to reuse your column. So it's important to regenerate that surface. And we've shown here you can do that. On the right hand side, you can see an example of how well that Optima works when it's been attached to a small scale purification column. So the input material on the left hand side of the gel, you can see there the um, Target of interest is the, the dominant band, but it only represents about 30 to 50% of the input material. So there's a lot of crude other contaminants in there. By the time we've put that, opt, uh, that target down an optimal loaded column, captured it, washed away all the contaminants, and then eluted it, you can see the product is now between 90 and 95% pure. So we've got a good strong band of the eluted material, and all the contaminants are gone. The important thing here is that the client and the customer can tell us what those elution conditions need to be. So this can be compatible with your target. We don't need to use harsh regeneration conditions. So you don't need to worry about using denaturants or anything like that in your elution conditions. So you don't worry about destroying your product as you go. I mentioned being able to reuse your um, Optima based column. Here again is a biosensor example where we've immobilized the Optima and you can see 50 cycles of binding, washing and releasing here, capturing the same target over and over again, releasing it and then going again. And when we take those 50 traces and overlay them, you can see at the bottom of the slide there how reliable and reproducible that is. So you can reuse your column. Um, there's several other examples where we've done this. So again, a very different target here, but the same idea. So the Aptima was attached to the biosensor, 
We've then washed it and introduced the target. Here, again, you can see concentration dependent binding of that target. So more target going on, higher response. That's retained during the wash. And then as soon as we change to the elution buffer, everything comes away. And you can see again, when we attach that to a column, we can put that on a standard FPLC system. And you can see the flow through there, all washing away. And we have a very clean, very sharp elution peak that when you run that on a gel, we've got a good clean product. We can also do this on more complicated systems. So in this example, we didn't want to purify a single protein. We wanted to purify a protein complex. So in this case, uh, a vaccine product that was made up of multiple protein domains all stuck together in a complex. It was important to be able to bind that complex without disrupting it and then elute under conditions where the whole complex came together. And you can see again, when this um, optima was put onto a column, we purified the protein. And then when you see the gel, you can see that the proteins that are involved in that complex were all retained. So we purified the whole molecule. And then I, I mentioned previously, we developed a binder against the spike protein from COVID. You can see here again, those um, spike protein binding optimas being used in a purification platform. So here, again, it was important to note that the optima bound both the spike to the right um, receptor binding domain. It also bound to the trimer, so we could purify the trimer, and it actually bound to the whole virus, so we could purify the viral particles. So here's an example where we can use those binders to purify a whole virus if we need to. So if you're using things like AAV or other um, viral vectors, you can actually use an Optima binder to purify those out as well. So I've talked about bioprocessing. Um, for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to talk about therapeutic-based applications of Optimus. So one of the most um, obvious applications of Optima binders is using them as a delivery vehicle. So you can attach a cargo to them and use the specificity of the Optima to take your drug molecule or your target of interest to a specific cell type. So you can see in the data here that we've generated a binder through our hypothesis-free approach. So we don't know what the target is for this binder yet, but you can see very, very clearly that the Optima binds to TGF beta activated hepatic stellate cells across the top of the slide there. So the optimum is stained in red, but it doesn't recognize primary hepatocytes. You can see that across the bottom of the slide. So we've got cell specific recognition. They can then be attached to a whole variety of different cargos. So in the example here, this is a different optima um, against um, H929. So you can see in the flow cytometry data at the top left, the Optima is very specific. It binds to H929, but doesn't bind to K562. In the data underneath that, you can see fluorescence microscopy, again, showing binding to the H929, but not K562. You can then see in the gel, in the, um, the top middle of the um, image there, that the Optima has been successfully conjugated, in this case, to an antisense oligo, an ASO. And then on the top right hand side, you can see a number of different things happening. So firstly, you can see that the ASO on its own in gray on the left hand side, binding to those cells. So there's no specific delivery here. There's a, a very small knockdown effect. The Optima on its own in yellow next to that having very little effect at all. But what's important is the blue bar towards the middle of the graph. You can see when the Optima is conjugated to that ASO, the Optima takes that, op, uh, that ASO specifically to the cells and gives you an improved knockdown. So you've got a, a delivery and an improvement in activity. Now, there's also um, important things happening on the um, next three examples on the left-hand side data set. So you can see the ASO alone binding to the control cell line, so the K562 with the black bar there. So the Optima is actually being taken up non-specifically by those cells and having quite a significant knockdown. You've knocked down about 50% of the activity there from the ASO alone. However, when you have the Optima conjugated to the ASO, so we're looking now at the, um, the 
green greenish bars on the right hand side you can actually see that that knockdown effect no longer happens in the k562 so what you're seeing there is the optima is stopping that aso going to cell types that we don't want it to so not only have we demonstrated delivery and improved uptake in our target cells we've also demonstrated that we can stop non-specific uptake or unwanted uptake in other cell types so you can really use the optimus here to deliver exactly where you need to go other examples of using optimus as therapeutics you can use them as direct therapeutics so not as a delivery vehicle but to directly impact a protein's function in this case we're using the optimus against a, um, a splicing factor and what you can see on the um, micro, uh, microscopy images on the left hand side of the slide the optimus stained in red is quite clearly getting to the nucleus of the cell and staining its target of interest now what you can also see there is an antibody that's directed against this same target showing up the protein as well now it's important to note here if you look at the merge the optima doesn't stain all the same regions that the antibody does. Now that's really important because this optima was designed to be specific to a mutated form of this splicing factor. It doesn't recognize the wild type. The antibody is not able to discriminate between the two. So the antibody staining both mutant and wild type where the optima is only staining the mutant. This is really important for its function. Now, when you look at the activity effect of that optima, you can see that it's actually partially blocking the um, mutated splicing and is allowing the wild type splicing to be restored. So you can see in the um, gel image in the center of the, uh, the slide there with the negative control, so the untreated cells, you've got a very strong mutant spliced mRNA and very little wild type indicated by the red and green arrows respectively. However, when you treat the cells with Optima, you can see that the amount of mutated mRNA that's being produced is significantly reduced and the amount of wild type spliced mRNA increases. We've also mentioned that um, previously you can use Optimus to recognize viruses. Well, if you recognize the spike protein on the surface of a virus, you've then got the potential to block that protein-protein interaction. So you can stop the virus infecting cells. Now, if you can use the Optimus to block viral entry, you could also block other protein-protein interactions. But in this case, let's talk about viral infection. So on the left hand side, you can see a panel of different optimas being screened and you can see the ones in the middle of that graph very clearly reduce viral infectivity. So they're binding to that spike, stopping it interacting with its receptor on the surface of a cell and therefore stopping viral infection. The data in the middle of that uh, slide then shows a concentration dependent response. So you can see the optima with the triangle traces there showing very clear dose dependent response. So blocking viral infection. And then the data on the right hand side of the slide, you can see three of the different optima candidates, the black bars showing a reduction in viral infection. But when we scramble those sequences and create the white bars, so for example, F2M is a scrambled version of the optima F2. When we scramble that sequence up, it no longer has an effect. So it's a specific optima effect. It's just not, it's not non-specific interactions with nucleic acids. So again, using the optima to block a protein-protein interaction, and in this case, block viral uptake. So just in summary, um, optimas are synthetic oligonucleotide-based ligands that can be used for all sorts of applications. So wherever you can use an antibody, you can use an optima in its place. Um, optimas are isolated against virtually any sort of targets, so proteins, cells, tissues, whatever you want. They're reliably manufactured on large scales because they're synthetic. So that minimizes your batch to batch variability. So they're more reliable molecules. They can be stored dry and shipped without cold chain. So you can use them wherever you want without that worry of degradation. They can be used in all sorts of applications from simple um, assays like Elona's all the way through to cell based assays like um, flow cytometry and IHC. Um, you can also use them for 
um, bioprocessing and quality control. And at Optima Group, we have specific processes tailored for each of those target types so we can develop binders against virtually any sort of target. So if you have um, any target of interest, please do come and see us. We'd be happy to help where we can. So thank you for your attention and I will now take questions. Is, are there advantages to using optimas over other technologies such as antibodies or protein scaffolds for assay development? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, there definitely are. I would say the most obvious advantage is the synthetic nature of the um, Optima binders. So you can manufacture them, as I said in the presentation, on much larger scales through routine chemistry. So you've got a much more reliable and much more scalable um, manufacturing process. So you don't have the batch to batch variability that you might see with antibodies. So your assays are more reliable. And during that synthesis, you can incorporate virtually any sort of reporter you want. So you can put a biotin on the end if you wanted to. So you can use strep HRP, for example, in an ELISA, or you can put a fluorophore on there and directly detect that um, binding event. So yeah, they're a lot easier to work with. That's great. Are there um, any circumstances where Optimus might not be a suitable tool for use in an assay? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a very fair one. Yes, there are situations where an Optima might not be suitable. Um, so, for example, Optimus um, don't work particularly well in extreme conditions. So we're talking extremes of pH, you know, less than pH 2, um, above pH 14, they generally unfold and they can either be hydrolyzed or protonated. So at extremes of pH, an optima would probably be degraded. Um, they also don't work particularly well in organic solvents. So you know, if you're working with something that's not uh, an aqueous-based system, an optima may not be the best thing for you. The next question next. is, can the small molecule binding optimas be used as ribose switches for controlling gene expression? That's a really good question. Um, simple answer is yes. Uh, so one of the great things about optimas, as I mentioned in the presentation, they're very flexible molecules. So when a target, um, especially a small molecule, engages with an optima, it undergoes quite a significant conformational change. So if you think of that in terms of a ribo switch, which has a very defined structure, if an optima is built into that ribo switch, when its target is engaged with the optima, that changes the conformation of the optima and then the environment around it. So the ribo switch as well. So you can turn either a ribo switch on or off depending on the nature of that interaction. So yes, they can, and they're very good at it. Thanks, David. Thanks. The following question is, you showed fluorescent IHC data in this presentation. Is it possible to use chromogenic readouts for IHC with Optima binders? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, the Optimas, when you manufacture them, is routine chemistry. So you can build up your Optima and then put whatever you want on the end of the Optima. So that could be a fluorophore, but it could just as easily be either a biotin or other functional group. And then you can attach whatever you want. So for, if we use the biotin example, you can then use that to capture for example, strep HRP and turn over a substrate to give you a, a colorimetric readout. That's great. And the final question is, how do you tune the affinity of the optimum binders for gen solution in affinity chromatography? For example, would it be possible to develop optimum binders for binding and release at the same pH? Yeah, good question. Um, we actually do that tuning during the selection process. So if you think about how Optima development works, we take your target of interest and immobilize it onto a solid support. And then we interact that with the Optima library. So we can put that under one set of conditions 
and allow the Optima library to engage with your target. We can then use that solid support to pull out your target and any Optimas that are bound to it. We can then wash away any of the weakly associated binders and leave only the best ones. We can then change the environment of that um, interaction. So you said, for example, you could put them on, in the same buffer, but change, for example, the salts that are in there. So increase the ionic strength, for example. That would then um, disrupt that Optima interaction with its target and release the binder. So when you come to use that in protein purification, you can flip the whole situation on its head and immobilize the Optima and do exactly the same thing. So the Optima will bind to its target under one set of conditions, one pH, for example, and then you can change the conditions, increase the salt, and the Optima will let go and release your target into solution. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, if there's any more questions, can you please email them to the email address on the screen? Thank you very much.